Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in Hernando County. And joining me today is one of our master gardener volunteers, Bernie. Good morning, Bernie. How are you? Good morning, doctor. I'm fine. And we should also have our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Colby. And it looks like, boom, there he is. Good morning. Sorry about Good that. Good morning. How are you? Doing well. Busy day, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot going on. Yeah. Same here. Um, we just had a very good class yesterday, live in person outdoors. And it was a beautiful day too. Um, rain barrel class and a uh, compost bin class at our master gardener nursery. So if any of you are Hernando County residents and you're interested about those in the future, let me go ahead and what's the best way for them to find out information about that? Let's try our, there's a link to our Facebook page. We always put them on our Facebook page. And Colby, I saw that you created an event for the next one that I'll share on our page when I get a chance in a little bit. So follow mm -hmm. us on Facebook and find out about our upcoming rain barrel classes and compost bin classes and come out and join us. Um, uh, the next class, I believe, is Monday, uh, January 22nd. It's going to be here at the Utilities Admin Building. Um, they're pretty, pretty quick and easy. Give you the... The down and dirty on why rain barrels are important and why composting is important, how to do it. It's uh, I enjoy doing them, so yeah, no. I think it's a great uh, a great thing that we do here. Give you a give you a pretty sweet deal on a rain barrel and an even sweeter deal on a compost barrel or uh, compost bin. Because compost bins are free, you can't get mm -hmm. any any less expensive than that. I'm not used to doing those things on Monday though. That'll be strange, but it's not seven o'clock Monday morning, is it? No, it's at ten. Okay. I had to you look don't want at to do anything too early on a Monday. No, no, no. I had to look at our uh, the the availability of our room and my availability through the end of the month, and that was just the day that lined up with everybody we needed. Okay. So, hey, everybody watching us live. If you have any lawn and garden questions, just go ahead and put those questions in the comments and we will do our very best to figure out an answer to them. I mean, that's kind of why we're here. And if you're watching a recording of this, um, we will be showing all the links, how to get in touch with me, how to get in touch with Colby or Bernie to be able to contact us with your questions. Pictures. Pictures are very important. Lots of good, clear pictures. I tell people there's no such thing as too many pictures, right, Bernie? Absolutely. And and uh, if, if you're going to send a picture of, of a problem with a tree, for instance, and, and it's affecting the leaf, let us see a picture of, of what the effect is and maybe a picture of the whole tree. So uh, you know, if, if we only have one little picture, you know, if, if, if it's something that's, that's dead and you've got a, a dead leaf with a spot on it, basically you have a dead leaf with a spot on it. So try and get us something uh, that, that is in the, the transition stage. The, the problem is almost always in the transition. So uh, if it can be half good and half bad uh, and, and the overall picture, uh, it, that really helps. Uh, too often we just get a, a picture of, of a problem, mm -hmm. a nice, beautiful picture, but, but we have no way to tell uh, what, what the actual uh impact is because we don't have everything in the picture so more pictures is wonderful thank you and from different perspectives like up close and from far away so we get pictures of citrus trees go ahead and send us a picture of the leaf that you're concerned about but send us a picture of the whole small tree also that gives us a, a better idea of what could be wrong how widespread the effect is yeah i've, I've gotten some uh 
plant ID questions or, uh, you know, tell me what's wrong with this questions and not even just at work, just like from members of my family, they'll come up with, and they have this, the worst. Yeah. What tree is this? And I have a leaf and it's like, man, that's a, that's a big ask. That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of key searching and, uh, guessing. And I probably won't even be right with the small amount of information you gave me. Well, yeah, I, with, with leaves, it's very important to see how they're attached also. Mm -hmm. So just one, a picture, just one leaf helps, but picture of a branch to show how the leaves are attached in relation to each other is oh, very, yeah. very helpful. Now, for like families of, of trees, the, the leaves are, are fairly uh, similar uh, mm -hmm. from variety to variety. And, you know, a, a real good example is a live oak and a laurel oak. Uh, if, if you send us nothing but a picture of the leaf, it's pretty hard to, to make a, a really positive identification. But the growth habit of the two trees is so different. Uh, that's, a, that's a case of a, a close up of the leaf and, and a far away picture of, of the tree uh, makes it much easier to do a real identification. Yeah, I think it's really. Uh... You really, when you're trying to do plant ID, you have to. I mean, being there's the, being there's the best thing. But I, I, I've, t I've like taken pictures and then came back to figure out what something is, and it's like, man, I wish I took a picture of this, and this, and this, and well, I wish I just dug the thing up and brought it here because I would have been able to figure out what it was. Um, you really need a complete picture to positively ID a lot of things, unless it's something really obvious. And there's a lot of times where if you send pictures to us for a plant ID we will just forward it to the University of Florida's herbarium and they have a very, very good, excellent plant ID person up there and he'll get back to us right away, say what it is, include links, say if it's invasive or native and a lot of information about it. And then I could just, we just turn around and take that and share it with the person who's asking about the plant. Things people who are really good at plan ID are, are really, really good at plan ID. Yeah. The, the ones that are really tough are, are the ones that you buy it at the big box store, and all it says on the tag when you get it is foliage. And, uh, <laughs> who knows what those things are? Yeah, a... Sometimes we can identify them, sometimes you really can't. I mean, it this, this is something that they picked up. Uh, on a trip to Mozambique, and it was growing uh, in the guy's backyard. Nobody knows what it is, but uh, we cloned it, and we're now selling 6,000 of them a day because they look beautiful. Those are foliage. foliage. Yeah, and all it says is foliage. Mm. Okay, Susan shared something very important about if you're working out in the garden, wear your hats because there's a lot of migratory birds coming through. I've seen large groups of blackbirds and crows. What's a group of crows called, Bernie? A murder. Okay, a mur I've seen lots of murders of crows, if that makes any sense. Um, I've seen a lot of large groups of birds that are probably either here for the winter or just passing through. When the uh, uh, dairy was uh, just on the north edge of Brooksville, uh, we would go there for the uh, annual Christmas bird count, the Audubon group. And uh, there was a flock of uh, brown-headed cowbirds, which are a black bird with brown head. And uh, mm -hmm. that flock would uh, number in the thousands. It, it was just amazing that if, if you would startle them and, and get them to take flight, uh, they'd actually darken the sky. It, it was uh, really gorgeous. So there's a lot of birds that, that come through here. There's a lot of birds that come here and stay here. So uh, the, there's a little bird that, that runs through the, the yard and, and you don't even notice them. You go out and there's nothing there and, and you startle them and, and 50 birds take off out of your yard. And it, it's uh, one of those things where the, the, the tails flick, if, if you get see one where it, it's sitting there with the tail flicking, they're, they're a pine warbler. And uh, I don't know why they're called pine warblers because, or a palm warbler, because they're not necessarily in pines or palms. They're out there in my front yard. So Yeah, yeah. 
I've had robins come through in the spring and they'll just fill my backyard and they love my vegetable garden because they will dig through all the compost in it, all the mulch, literally turn the soil over and eat every last bug and worm and whatever else they could possibly find out there. And that's just fine with me. They basically clean it out and then they all fly off. You, uh, you mentioned the, like the funny name, like the murder of crows. So many animals have so many different strange names for groups of them. And mm -hmm. I have no idea just who's in charge of coming up with that. Flamboyance of flamingos is one that I particularly like. Uh, a conspiracy of lemurs is another one. Uh, and it's like, who comes up with these things? Yeah, who's in charge of that? Who who makes it up and it becomes official? Yeah, I uh, I think it's like a a leap of lemurs and a or a, a leap of uh, man panthers or leopards or something. One of the cats, and then you have uh, there's there's just so many, and it's so strange because it's not like you know you have you have these scientific names that are curated over time, and different people have to agree, and then you have you know a uh, a nuisance of cats or pride of lions. Mm -hmm. Pride of Lions, there you go. There must be an international committee. Must The UN must be in charge of that one. <laughs> <laughs> we got a question here. Bill asks, there's lots of potential rain coming. Yes, there is apparently for, especially for this weekend, depending on exactly where you live. Uh, probably not a good day to apply potassium on the lawn. What's your opinion on applying potassium to the lawn this time of year? Potassium is not a pollutant, so it's not a problem like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus is, you know, if it gets into groundwater or surface water or in the Gulf of Mexico, those, you know, um, nutrients or pollutants. Potassium is safe to use, but obviously you don't want to waste your money and put it down, and then you get four inches of rain and it all washes away. It's kind of a waste of money, and potassium ain't free at the Lawn and Garden Center. So um, you may want to wait until after this weekend and with any fertilizer, you know, any bag of lawn potassium, if you read the label, it's going to tell you that after you apply this, water it in with a quarter inch of water, half inch, you know, it's going to depend on the label. So follow those directions. A lot of times you have to water it in just a little bit to make the granules dissolve and go into the top layer of soil where the roots can get to the potassium. And then hopefully it's not going to rain so often that like every two or three days, it's going to pour rain and wash all this away. So if you can pick a time where it's not going to rain for at least a few days and follow the label directions, that should work. And I guess it's a Congress of baboons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so strange. Um, could you... You know, substitute water again if you know that there's a light rain coming. You put down fertilizer. Could you substitute a light rain? Sure, you could, but it depends on how much rain is coming. Yeah, you got to be a pretty good uh, meteorologist, I suppose. Yeah, and they'll, they have the, the, you know, the weather maps and the different colors that show about how much rain we're going to get over a day or two or three. Mm -hmm. And that's a good guide, but not completely accurate. You know, potassium is not as mobile in the soil as a lot of things. Potassium uh, is, is fairly heavy ionized and, and it tends to uh, attach to the soil particle. Uh, farmers uh, don't really worry about that uh, because of the, the potassium stays there. Things like phosphorus uh, that uh, don't tend to stay in the soil uh, are a problem and, and I really think people should put more potassium down during the growing season that, uh, you know, the, the logic on, on potassium is fairly inexpensive, really, but they, they tend to put it in the, the soil for lawns in the fall, the commercial people, and, and put nitrogen like crazy on the plant during the growing season. Well, that, that's great, but it, the root structure never really accommodates the, the size of the plant if you do that. I, I think that uh, putting potassium, more potassium down 
uh, and a slow release nitrogen, you end up with a lot healthier plant than uh, only putting potassium down in the fall, which is what the commercial people do. But then the commercial people still treat for chinch bugs when there hasn't been one alive in the county for 10 years. So. It's almost yeah. like there's another motivation uh, <laughs> other than having healthy plants. <laughs> And almost every soil test that I see in Hernando County, and it's going to be different in other counties, other areas, but in most of Hernando County, soil tests come back with people's uh, soil being low in potassium. Sometimes I see it okay. I don't think I ever see it high. Phosphorus is almost always high, but potassium is almost always low. Yeah. So adding, you know, fertilizing with just potassium doesn't hurt anything. It's not a pollutant. And the, the palms, you know, the, their requirement is they have to have the potassium while they've got nitrogen. If you if you fertilize a palm and, and you're fertilizing with a lawn type fertilizer, uh, you're actually damaging it because there isn't enough potassium while the plant's growing. So, uh, you know, this there, one, my feeling is that it doesn't hurt to uh, uh, put potassium down in the fall, but it, it would also benefit uh, adding potassium every time you put nitrogen down. So, yeah. And good palm tree fertilizers are relatively low in nitrogen and always contain potassium. Yeah. But I, I caution people, if you have a service... If you have a palm tree in your yard and it's all surrounded by turf grass and you have a service fertilizing, if they end up fertilizing your palm tree with a lot of liquid nitrogen, not a good thing. Palm tree is not going to be happy. Do that a couple times. Palm tree may be dead. So keep your, keep your service well away from your palm trees and put down just a quality palm fertilizer in that area. Now, palms need nitrogen uh, in small amounts, but they need potassium and magnesium in almost equal amounts all the time it's growing. And uh, uh, people, uh, Epsom salts has magnesium, that's magnesium sulfate. Yeah. And, and an old wives tale is you want to go out and put Epsom salts on your, your palm tree. Well, uh, no, you want magnesium, but that, that's not really the, the form that it needs to be in. If, if you're going to, uh, Put a little nitrogen fertilizer you need the magnesium continuously and what what tends to happen is you put the nitrogen down the palm goes into grow mode absorbs the potassium nitrogen keeps growing now it's it's short potassium and nitrogen and and magnesium the bottom leaves start to yellow and the plant gets unhealthy and if, if you keep doing that eventually the whole plant turns yellow and it takes you two, three years to get it corrected and get the, the thing back to all green again. So, you know, there, there's a lot more to this stuff uh, than uh, just what your neighbors tell you. The, the guy that looks over the fence and says you got chinch bugs is the same guy that looks over the fence and says, you need to put Epsom salts on your palm. No, you don't need to put Epsom salts on your palm. You need to put a balanced fertilizer that has slow release magnesium and slow release potassium and slow release nitrogen. Because if you give it any one of those things out of proportion, uh, it, it's actually damaging to the tree. Epsom salts does not benefit your palm tree. How about with your tomatoes? Because Diana asked, can she put Epsom salt on her tomatoes? Because a friend told her that she should do it. If, if your soil is low in magnesium, that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if you have a garden plot that's low on magnesium, Epsom salts, that's, that is one time where it's a beneficial product. It, it gives you a little sulfur, tends to offset the, uh, the uh, alkalinity of the soil slightly, puts a little magnesium down, doesn't hurt a thing because the uh, plant will only use so much magnesium it, it's not like a palm tree, but uh, mm -hmm. so you know, it, 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 there, it depends on what you're doing. Put it down lightly and add it to water and make sure you dissolve it and be very careful that you don't use Epsom salts like you would use in a bathtub 
with fragrances and perfumes and other stuff in it. Because your plants probably aren't going to like that. But just straight, pure Epsom salts. If you look at the ingredients, if it says um, magnesium sulfate, and that's all that's in it, that's Epsom salts. And it's a very, very soluble form of magnesium. And in light quantities, doesn't hurt plants. Yeah, you know, you know, If the plant doesn't the, need the magnesium, it just won't take it up. It's not hurting anything. The, the farmers, you know, after you put a big crop in and, and you've really stripped it, they go out and they put down 50, 70 pounds of, of magnesium or potassium or whatever per acre. Well, when you figure out uh, how much that is per square foot, we're talking grams, little tiny amounts. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, putting a pound of something down obviously is, is totally exceeds anything that, that you would possibly need. Uh, maybe a, a, a big garden might need three or four pounds of, of Epsom salts or magnesium. But for a little garden, uh, probably a cup would be a year would be more than adequate. Yeah. And just a tablespoon dissolved in a gallon or two of water and water them. That'd be fine. I don't fertilize my low plot trees. They they tend to do pretty well by themselves. Uh, low plots suffer from fire blight, and if you don't have a fire blight problem, uh, they pretty much a native. Uh, other than that, they aren't really a native, but they mm -hmm. they're very happy here. Yeah, and with most fruit trees or really well for most hardwood trees you really don't need to fertilize them so don't you don't need to fertilize your oak trees or pines or magnolias things like that but for a fruit tree if you want to fertilize it if you do it very lightly from spring through fall that's fine during the winter and i know loquats are different because they flower in the fall and ripen up their fruit in the spring you really don't need to fertilize them during the winter and Anything more than on a rare occasion, light fertilizing, I, I've never seen them really nutrient deficient. And Diana, thank you so much for coming to our class yesterday. Uh, I believe Diana was there. And thank you so much for sharing that the label is the law. That is proof that we've actually had some kind of positive impact here and taught that's somebody my something. favorite saying <laughs> favorite saying i love telling people the labels along. and let's go back for a, a question here that i missed from susan is this a good time to propagate some of our annuals things like mums and coleus i overwintered some once as shelf plants in a sunny window barney anybody no, that's flowers. That's that's your baby. Okay. <laughs> coleus, you can propagate any time of the year. And coleus is one of those plants where if you take a cutting and throw it on the sidewalk, it'll probably get roots and grow. Um, so definitely coleus is fine. Um, mums, I've never seen chrysanthemums do well here long term. They're beautiful when you see them at the lawn and garden shop because they've been grown in a greenhouse under perfect conditions and forced to flower. And they will look beautiful for a couple of weeks to grow them and keep them looking good and healthy and have them flower again long-term. Very, very difficult. Mums are almost a short-term annual here in Florida that you're going to get to look good for just a while, but very, very difficult to grow the one plant for year after year after year and have it grow and look good. And Diana was excited to get her compost bin and get it all set up and happy to know that she could use more than she thought for the brown part. So that's great. And Susan, you're welcome. And Diana, you are so happy or so welcome for all the different classes. Just keep following us. We got stuff coming up all the time. And I always sit down around the holidays and plan out my next six months or more worth of classes and activities and things coming up. I fly by the seat of my pants a little bit more than six months, but 
Um, yeah, I, I, well, I just tentatively plan it out. I do a lot of flying by the seat of my pants also. I try to get ideas like within the month. I try to have a, a, a decent plan of what's going on. I get a lot of stuff kind of, it'll just come up that I have to do this like right before I have to do it. So I have to keep a relatively flexible schedule. Well, I like the people that email you. They say, can you come and help teach a class or speak to our group or teach our master gardeners or whatever? And you look at the date and it's like eight months off. It's like, eight months? That's a lifetime away. First of all, my schedule is actually empty eight months from now. So, you know, I could put you in, but what's going to be going on in my life and emergencies and mandatory meetings and everything else to come up? Uh, yeah, eight months is way, 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 way far off. Yeah, I, I mean, I scheduled people for stuff in February, maybe in September. And I was like, oh, I mean, I'll put John here, but <laughs> well, we'll see. It's all tentative, isn't it? So Diana has some mums that keep coming back by her dryer vent outside, I guess. Um, it must be the, um, the, the constant warmth. Or is very, very happy with the spot where it's growing. And here's one. We want to grow the muscadine grapes, but now we have a big dog unexpectedly. Yeah, that's how it goes. Uh, I'm afraid to grow the grapes if they are bad for the dogs. Did anybody yes. know muscadine grapes are dangerous to dogs? Dogs, uh, they're poisonous to dogs. Grapes are not good for dogs. I think they're poisonous to cats too. Really? Can't eat dog. Yeah, they can't eat raisins or grapes. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some, uh, some quick research right now and find out exactly why. But I do know, I do know that they are that dogs cannot eat. Granted, it's like I'm pretty sure it's like they can't have any grapes at all, or they'll get real sick. I know it's it causes them some uh, GI issues. Mm -hmm. I want to say is the the main deal. We're here since we're talking unexpected big dogs. There's ours. <laughs> That's cashmere. So need to try to squeeze them in and give give them a little more airtime, I guess. So we'll find out about uh, dogs and grapes. Yeah. So, so okay. If, yes. If you were able to keep the dog reliably away from the grapes, that would work. It, it depends on exactly how your yard is laid out and where you're going to grow them. So, yeah. So, uh, I guess they cannot, uh, it, it is kidney issue. They can't metabolize some of the, uh, there's some tannins and all kinds of stuff in them that they can't, they cannot process. So I think all that stuff just gets clogged up in their kidneys and it, it, um, can cause like renal failure. So I would say, um, and see if you can keep your dog out of there, that's fine. But I know that my, the dog, the dogs that my parents have when I lived there, it was like they, anything that they feel, think they might be able to eat, they will just get after it. Um, but it, it's even in very, very, very small amounts. So, uh, yeah, grapes, poisonous to dogs. Okay. So lesson for today, keep your dogs away from eating grapes or raisins. And even like the jelly and like grape products that have grape stuff in them. Not even, be aware, be aware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a, a hundred percent that all dogs have that problem and not all varieties of grape have that problem. But uh, I had looked this up a couple of weeks ago and, and they aren't sure uh, what the exact uh, failure mode is what what causes it and it, it's not really predictable it, at least at this point it, it's one of those things that uh, nobody's really doing any research they know it's not good uh right, easier just to keep your dog meat right really yeah 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 to err on the side of safety yeah mm -hmm. I, it, it makes me a little nervous doing so i i have cats and it makes me nervous kind of having plants in the house because I know that they'll uh, 
the cats will just if they they like to chew on plants and eat grass like dogs do. So it's like oh, yeah. man, I get so nervous about uh, having plants in the house. Well, there are really good um, websites, um, national canine organizations, and you can go online and they have databases where you can either, you know, look up lists of what dogs cannot eat, what cats mm -hmm. cannot eat, uh, put it in the, the search box to see if it's safe or whatever. I know that when we get questions, um, anything to do with pastures as far as using insecticides, fungicides, herbicides to kill weeds and pastures. We have a multi-county um, livestock agent, Laura Bennett, who has not been on here in forever. I need to get a hold of her and have her back on to talk about this because she knows about that. I don't. I can tell you what to put on your front lawn in your Bahia grass lawn to kill weeds, but she knows what you can use to kill weeds that are safe for the animals that are grazing and which things are not safe for them. And there's a whole, you know, goats are different from horses, which are different from cows. Each animal is different, what it can and cannot eat, what it can be exposed to, and it's dangerous or not dangerous. So I, I send everybody to her for that kind of expert information. Yeah, I, I have like very anecdotal experience with that kind of stuff. So it's like once you're past my very specific experience level with spraying crab apples <laughs> or soda apples in in the pasture uh, that we had our cow pasture then i'm just i'm like ah oh, well it's a little much a little much for me i don't i didn't learn much about um pasture animal toxicity in oh, yeah, that's not my area of expertise guys and you know i'll i'll be honest and admit it don't know much about um pastures or livestock or birds or snakes. I know black snakes. I know what a black snake looks like. Outside of that, I'm really not very good with IDing snakes. I can I can ID snakes pretty well. Mm -hmm. I, uh, well snakes got a black nose. Mm -hmm. Just check the nose before you pick it up. Yeah, just get real close. No, do not do that. Don't if you see a snake, just don't mess with it. And I'll ask again, Bernie, where do people get bit by most? By snakes. Where's the bites at? In the in the web between the fingers. Is the, uh huh. Because you're you're wiggling off. them things, trying to get that snake. Leave it alone, man. It's not going to get you. Uh huh. Just don't mess with it. Turn around and and what a lot of times happens when you encounter a snake, it surprises you, and you jump and do the snake dance, and you surprise it. If you go one way and the snake goes the other way. No big deal, no big problem. But some people, oh my gosh, those people that live in the villages, every snake, every oh, snake goodness. is an anaconda coming to kill them in the middle of the night. And every snake must be disposed of. And I I would be shocked if there's more than two or three snakes that in all of the villages at this point. Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. People move to Florida, but don't want to live in Florida. <laughs> yeah, and, and guys, if you can't deal with snakes in your yard and spiders and snails and things like that you may want to consider about looking at a condo and living on the 13th floor because then you don't have to deal with any living things outside you'll have almost no indoor pests as long as you don't bring indoor pests in in furniture baggage you know luggage whatever it might be you won't have a problem you won't need those sticky strips you won't need to spray much of anything and, you know, if you can't deal with it, seriously consider 13th floor of a condo. In another state, please. No. You know, I hear the weather is beautiful in Arizona, <laughs> especially during the winter. Very dry there also. I, you know, I, I, I said it's great in Pennsylvania. And, you know. Snow. If you're into snow, they got that there. No I, snow I here. The weather is beautiful up there. They don't have any insects up there in Pennsylvania. They don't have any weeds. No snakes or nothing. So, so get a hold of Lily and have her help you find a place in her neighborhood and move up to Pennsylvania. <laughs> I've had snakes in the house twice. Uh, well, got up one morning and, and the cats are out in the kitchen looking at something. I go over and, and there's a coral snake. So I got a bucket, swept it into the bucket, took it a couple blocks away and dumped it out. 
And uh, last week we had the uh, front door open. The weather was nice. I'm letting the, the dogs go in and out. It's fenced area. And uh, Susie said, hey, a, a snake just crawled in, went under the, the console. So uh, I went over and, and took the broom underneath and a little coral, or not a little coral, a little uh, gardener crawls out. I, I swept him up, took him out, dumped him back outside, you know. But I assume that he came in because it was a little warmer and, uh, mm -hmm. but he, he was no, no threat. And, and the snakes, for the most part, are not a threat. The, the absolute worst thing that, that you can have here is a pygmy rattler. They, they mm -hmm. tend to be nasty, mean, vicious, hateful snakes. The, yeah. the rest of the snakes, if you leave them alone, uh, yeah. they, they either don't bother and can't hurt you or they aren't really going to bother you. But uh, the pygmy rattler, for some reason, tends to bite people just because they can and uh, yeah, it's having a bad day one. it's and making it's bad day your problem there that's gonna yeah the, the, those will those will like chase you down yeah. you're not you really need to pay attention yeah and i've always been told that water moccasins are really bad also for anybody who lives near water or, you know lake or river mm -hmm. that they, they can be they can be aggressive uh in my experience though most of the time uh they're not they're not going to go out of their way to get you the same way like a pygmy, pygmy rattler was would but you know they're, they're definitely dangerous um i try to just just stay away from them if i can help it uh the only snakes we ever had in the house uh when i was a kid were ones that we brought in to mess with my mom which is funny now because my little sister has a uh she has a a, uh, a burmese python that lives in her closet in a in a as a pet and it's it's you never would have thought because the little sister can't feed it so my mom has to feed it <laughs> so mom's cool with snakes now i suppose it always cracks me up think just thinking about that bill yes sir with, with the the holiday season people are getting uh plants for christmas Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as a general rule, most of the plants uh, end up just dying and, and nothing happens. But like the poinsettias, uh, what do you think about putting them in the ground here? Obviously, if you're farther south where it's not going to freeze, you know, you're not going to get any frost, uh, poinsettias do very, very well. But uh, uh, what do you think about putting another plant in the ground here where you may have to cover it? Uh, they make a gorgeous bushy plant with a lot of flowers. Yeah, if they if they are happy where you plant them and take off, they can get really large. I've seen people that have created poinsettia hedges that look very nice and foundation plantings. So if you get a poinsettia, somebody gives it to you as a gift or you buy one on clearance, or you just want to get one for the holidays to dress up the house, don't throw it away. Plant it in the garden. They can do very, very well here in Central Florida. They can freeze, though. So it's one of the things that when it gets really close to freezing, you're going to have to cover it during the winter. Other than that, they do very well. Little trick is you want to prune them twice a year during the months that begin with A. So April, and for April, you're going to clean it up, get rid of the old uh, holiday growth and everything, get it, get it all set for the spring and summer growth. And then it's going to grow during the spring and summer. You need to prune it back again in August because they can get leggy, especially outside. Uh, maybe a little bit of spider mite damage, this and that. Clean it up, prune it back after August. Leave it alone, and hopefully, it's going to turn. It's going to flower and get the red or whatever color poinsettia you bought, bracts, which are the colored leaves that are around the flower. For what, most what holiday about? plants, they require um, darkness to trigger them to flower and do their thing in time for the holidays. As a general rule, if you have a small outdoor light or a porch light that you turn on and off, sometimes it's not going to disrupt them that much. If you plant it in the front yard, basically right below a street light, that can disrupt it. That it can disrupt Christmas cactus, poinsettia, probably a couple of other winter flowering things because it doesn't 
it can't tell that the days are really short. So putting it in a spot where it's not going to get nighttime light is better. And we can't guarantee that your poinsettia is going to turn color in time for Christmas. It may be early, maybe a little late. But if it grows and does well, it's going to turn color at some point during the winter, usually around Christmas, pretty close. Uh, Christmas cactus, another really good plant. Don't plant it in the ground outside or put it in, in a container where it's getting rained on because we get too much rain every summer than a Christmas cactus can handle. They will drown. So you need to keep them on the dry side and water them with your watering can. Put them outside on the porch during the summer in the shade, but in a spot where they're not getting rained on, you have to water them. And Christmas cactus will do great. Amaryllis is another common holiday plant. Take those bulbs. You can plant them in the ground outside. They grow very, very well here. They're going to come back year after year. Flower late winter, early spring. Some people will plant a whole bunch of amaryllis bulbs in their yard. And Bernie, I don't know if you get one or two questions a year, but it seems like I always do about, I have 50 amaryllis bulbs in a bed in my yard, and they didn't flower this year. Why? I don't know. Some years they just don't flower. Other years they flower great. What about about the uh, Christmas trees that are are potted trees that... uh... Is it really a, a good thing to uh, plant those as, as you're landscaping? And, and do you need to be careful where you plant them? Yes and no. Those are the little Norfolk Island palms or um, pine trees. If you plant them, you can grow them here. And they will grow really, 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 really tall and really skinny. They'll get like two or three times as tall as your house. And then in a hurricane or tropical storm or just thunderstorm, it'll snap and fall on your house. They can become a big pain pretty quickly. If you plant one in your yard and you plan on keeping it only there for just a couple years, and then you're going to give it the ax, basically, that works. If you try growing them in a container, a pot, they're, they're still going to grow very big, very fast, and they're going to bust whatever pot you put them in. So, you know, they're not, they're not, they're native to um, New Zealand. So they're not native to Florida or, eat, or you know, anywhere in the U.S. But they, they grow well, they grow big, they grow fast. Yeah, if you, uh, seems like if you want to plant those in your yard, just do a refresher on uh, geometry. And, you know, use Pythagorean theorem, calculate how far away it needs to be so that when it falls, it doesn't hit your house. <laughs> there you go. And Amory's wondering about fertilizer for poinsettias and Christmas cacti. For both, well, Christmas cacti, you're probably going to have it in a container. So using a um, water-soluble fertilizer, a miracle Grow or Peter's uh, fertilizer type product. Uh, light application during the growing season is more than enough. Poinsettias, if you put them outside, very, very light scattering is 666 or 10, 10, 10. A couple times between spring and fall during the growing season. I know Anne Marie grows, lives further north of us, so her growing season's a little bit different and shorter. That's fine for them. Neither one is a really heavy feeder. And the paper whites, the paper white narcissus bulbs, you can buy them. You can grow them here. They'll flower in the little pot and look very, very nice for the holidays. Bernie, do narcissus bulbs do well here outside? I don't think so. I don't think so either for almost all the standard ones that you're going to find as a gift or at a big box store. I know that there is a, and I don't think it's native, but a Florida type narcissus. There is one variety that's going to do well here in Florida. One of our master gardeners got it before and grew it. And his, you know, keeps growing and flowers year after year. But most of the one that you might find for sale, like Target or Walmart or Lowe's or Home Depot, those are probably going to be more of an annual. They're probably not going to survive yeah. here and come back. 
you know, uh, the, talking about the Norfolk Island Pine, uh, driving along on the uh, East West Expressway over to Orlando, and I was amazed. There was the largest Norfolk Island Pine I have ever seen. It was mammoth. And I got close enough to realize it's a cell tower, and that was the uh, <laughs> camouflage. It wasn't really a tree. I had a, but it's amazing how it absolutely looked like the real thing from a mile away. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Strange. Okay, I just made myself a note to email the master gardener who I believe had narcissus bulbs and see what he has to say and see what he says about the variety. And I'm not going to swear that it was Narcissus. It's, it's definitely a bulb that normally doesn't grow here in Florida, but there is a variety or a type of variety that you can grow and it's going to do well. So I'll check into that and hopefully be able to report back to you next week. And with some of these different plants, Cherry asked, I have a greenhouse. Should I keep it shut? No ventilation. My plants are tropical. I just moved to Ocala. So you you definitely need ventilation. So you, you think the plants are going to uptake carbon dioxide out of the air? Well, they take it all up and there's no ventilation. Well, then they don't have any more. Uh, and you really need to, to make sure that you're you're exchanging that air, getting them more carbon dioxide, you know, and ex exchanging the oxygen, etc. Also, uh, you, you're going to have, if you don't ventilate, you're going to have different, uh, like, temperature discrepancies that may affect how the plants are going to grow if you're not exchanging that air. Um, and you don't even have to have fans. If, if you have a tall enough greenhouse roof, you can just put vents up there. The hot air will rise out, and you'll be okay. But I think the bet, I mean, if you really want some real deal good ventilation, just put a big old fan on the roof, and you'll be all right. Yeah, some of those greenhouse fans can mm -hmm. move and exchange a lot of air quickly and your plants are going to need it for during the day. Now, if it's a really, really cold night, you can just button it up mm -hmm. tight and keep everything warm overnight. And the earlier in the day that you button it up, the more extra heat for the last hour or two of sunlight, depending on where your greenhouse is physically located in your yard, uh, is going to kind of get it a little bit extra warm in there. So it's going to hold that warmth overnight. Greenhouses are a lot of fun and they can work really well in Florida. You don't use them a whole lot during the summer though, because it just, it's just too hot and too hard to keep below 110 degrees in your greenhouse. I know that uh, a lot of those greenhouse like chimney things, uh, I don't know what to call them, but the, they're for ventilation. A lot of them have, uh, if they're on the roof, they end up having like a pull cord, and you walk by and just whack, and close it if it's going to be cold at night, and you pull it again or flip it or whatever, and it opens. Mm -hmm. So you can close and open them. That's probably something that I would make sure you, you have because uh, you'll be able to keep your plants warm in the winter, which I think that's one of the main benefits to having a greenhouse, I would think, since it's yeah. hot here all the time anyway. And they work, they're really important and work really well for keeping them warm overnight. You want to be careful that you don't fry your plants the next day. Because, you know, it can get like, well, up in Ocala, it can get like mid-20s overnight. The next morning, the sun comes up, the frost disappears, the ice melts off your windshield, it gets warm. And then by 11 a.m., it's a nice sunny day, it's 100 degrees inside your greenhouse. So things can warm up surprisingly fast. There's one of the uh, Chinese tool places that sells a uh, 10 foot by 10 foot greenhouse. Uh, they've sold lots of them. Uh, it, it looks really good for the first uh, six months that you own it. Uh, it disintegrates. They sell no parts. Uh, you cannot get it fixed. Uh, the uh, plastic panels all discolor. Uh, a, a strong wind, it starts disintegrating. It, it's a really bad deal, it, but it's six hundred dollars. Wow! And uh, I, I have known probably twenty people that bought them. I bought two, and uh, I don't know of anybody that's been happy with it. So 
Uh, if, you, if you're thinking of buying one from one of the Chinese tool places, uh, that particular uh, greenhouse is a terrible, terrible mistake. And uh, uh, that tip should have saved you $600 if you're thinking about it. Our master gardeners have one at the nursery, and there is the address. They're open on Wednesday mornings and Saturday mornings from 8.30 until noon. And they have a hoop house, you know, basically hoop house, greenhouse, plastic covered house that they use mostly for starting seeds. Although they a couple years ago, they had it empty and it was going into summer. Thing like, why are we wasting this space? You know what? You know, me and one of the master guard, me and Wynn Miller decided we're just going to fill it up with, I think we put some um, eggplants in there and all the rest hot peppers. And they don't mind the heat all that much. And we have ventilation in ours. We do have a fan. We have uh, automatic uh, spray irrigation in ours. And we we literally filled that thing with hot peppers for the summer. We went back in there. Nobody else wanted them. Um, we picked them all and split them. So, so they can work. They're a lot of fun. Um, the one the Master Gardeners built, I do have directions for building it here somewhere in my pile of papers. Gosh, I hate to imagine how much it would cost though now for materials. Oof. Concrete, two by fours, four by fours. And forget about the plastic and stuff. That's that's that stuff's super expensive right now. That and the plastic has to be replaced every couple of years. But we know it and we budget for it. Um what what would be if I wanted to plant some I know I'm not normally asking questions, but uh, if I wanted to plant some hot peppers, I want to make like vinegar pepper sauce. What peppers would I plant? That I could grow relatively easily. A lot of the hot peppers grow very well and very easily. Ones that I've grown that did really well in my yard because I grow hot peppers. For jalapenos, I've frozen a bunch of jalapenos and they're very, you just, you throw them in the freezer. Put them on a cookie sheet, put them in the freezer until they're all like little rocks. Throw them all together in a great big Ziploc bag. Throw them back in the freezer and they last for forever and work really well. I've grown Thai hot peppers, which are little small ones that turn red. They're the hot peppers that are in General Tso's chicken. If you ever go out for Chinese food. Mm -hmm. um, and they grew really well. I'll take them and dry them and grind them into a powder so that I have my own hot pepper powder seasoning. But the Thai hot peppers do well. Jalapenos do really well. Cayennes do well. Most all of them do well, really. Hmm. They'll take the summertime heat better than most other plants. Although, if you try to keep them growing all the way through summer here in Hernando County, you're only going to have to 50% success rate. Half, the time, half of them are going to die. The other half will survive, and in the fall, they perk up and flower and give you a whole second crop, a whole second flush of peppers. Yeah. But we had something that we called rooster spurs, tiny little guys. And they'd be yellow and green and red that were hot as Hades peppers. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I really liked those, and we I swear we had that plant forever. And then we had a, a bigger pepper plant that grew in like a 55-gallon drum, and it had little round like spherical peppers, which those ones were even hotter than the little tiny ones. And I, I don't know, none of us had a green thumb, so I was surprised they lasted that long. But it, it I was thinking about, I was like, man, I'd like to get yeah. me, make some pepper sauce. The round ones are cherry peppers, and they're really hot. I haven't grown them for a long time, but they're they're good. They're hot, and there are there's a variety of peppers called fish peppers that are a very, very old variety goes way back to colonial times hmm. for putting in food. And um, what's the one, the variety of hot pepper they grow around St. Augustine? That hmm. does well here also. Somebody watching, if you want to chirp in with the variety of peppers, or it'll come to me, um, that they've grown for 100 or 200 years around St. Augustine. It's a cross between a Cuban hot pepper and something else. They're not even really sure where it came from, but they've always grown it over there. 
you can grow it here and you can get seeds for it. So it really depends on exactly how hot you of a pepper a that you're going to want to work with. Daddle peppers. D-A-D-I-L, daddle peppers. Oh, daddles. I love the flavor. Yep. That is a great mm-hmm. pepper. Hmm. So, so you want something that's hot but tasty also. That's uh, my opinion. I know people who just love hot, hot, hot. Mm-hmm. You know, give me a whole bunch of habaneros and, you know, they're happy. Those, and that's great. Peppers. I think it I think it really depends if, with, with that vinegar sauce. It's like I just want the vinegar to be really hot, I think, is what I like. But uh, some of the other stuff that's not as hot, but more like I think a cayenne kind of fits in that category. I've been using cayenne yeah. when I make mac and cheese, just kind of loading yeah. it in there and it ends up being really good. I grew cayennes and I dried them and ground them. I grew jalapenos and I ended up with so many jalapenos. We made them stuffed. I froze a bunch. I dried a bunch and ground them. So that when you're, if you're putting together your own fajita seasonings or just, you know, sprinkled seasonings for whatever you're cooking, very, very, and the powder lasts for a very long time. So yeah, cayennes, cayenne, I've grown cayennes. They're easy. And Teresa woke up and put in a link here for growing hot peppers. There was a uh, Mexican restaurant in in Annapolis that had a stuffed pepper. Uh, The pepper was a little smaller. uh, It was about the size of a tennis ball, maybe a little smaller. And uh, they stuffed it with a uh, cheese and meat uh, stuffing. The pepper itself had about the, the heat of a jalapeno. They call them jalapenos, but I, I've never seen a jalapeno of that shape. So uh, I don't know what the pepper was, but I, I always loved those things. That, that's one thing I really miss here. Uh, it, it's hard to buy good stuff peppers now. Uh, here, I'm going to look for a uh, hot pepper speaker to come in. Since everybody's commenting on the hot peppers here, Anne Marie grows them also. I do have a dehydrator. It was a um, um, one of the uh, air fryers. It's a model air fryer that we bought, but it's got a little door in the front that you open up and you put you slide your stuff in. And my wife hated it for air frying, but it has a setting for drying. And it works fantastic for putting hot peppers or herbs or whatever you want in there. Set it for an hour or two, check it. Set it for so much longer, check it. When it's all completely dried out, grind it, and boom, you're done. You're good to go. Very, very easy. Um, Thai hot peppers, like I said, mine did really well. They took a while to grow, but when they got big and flowered really well, there were, there were a couple points where they were just covered with little red peppers. And I, when I harvested them, I got a big, big harvest off of them. And hot peppers, you can keep them growing for a number of years in theory. Summer is really hard on them. And winter, if you expose it to freezing temperatures, that's very hard on them and damaging too. So, yeah, jalapenos do fantastic, very easy to grow. You should get a nice big crop out of them. Uh Teresa's throwing up some more um, hot pepper links here. Um, This is probably a very good, very important um, fact sheet from University of Florida about peppers by Scoville units. And that's how they measure how hot a pepper is. So there is a big difference between a jalapeno and a habanero, if you didn't already know that. And don't, uh, go, don't, don't go trying hot pepper when somebody tells you, here, try this pepper. It's not hot. Don't eat the whole thing. They're lying to you. They're lying to you every time. Yep, yep, yep. That's Scoville unit. If, you, if, you, if you're interested in hot peppers and stuff, go go look into that. I've, I've had, uh, I remember I went down that rabbit hole one time, and I've yep. it, it led me to making, I like bought some crazy, crazy hot, the peppers, uh, the hot sauce off of the internet, then got it, and I, I felt like it almost sent me to the hospital. It was so hot. 
Yeah, there's there's pepper at the at the one and the mildest that I know of is ancho peppers. And there they might be a couple hundred Scoville units. And then the the Grim Reaper ones, and it seems like every year a different variety. Scary named pepper, yeah, something wins named the contest for hottest. They have like three, four, ten million Scoville mm-hmm. units. So well, I, I guess there's like a point at which there is a chemical like saturation. It can it cannot get any, which I imagine is just pure like capsaicin or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I, I saw I saw that a uh, some company made this this like it's like a chemically perfect hot sauce that is the max of it's like 36 million Scoville units, and it cannot get any hotter. And it's like I wouldn't think anyone would actually use that. I, I tried one that was two million. Scovo units and I, I was like, oh, it was like a reset, man. I'm I'm never doing anything like that again. But I got one that's a couple hundred thousand that I'll mix into other sauces to heat them up a little bit, which is yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. That's like um, habaneros. You probably don't want to make something like a hot sauce or pickled peppers or cowboy candy, which is candy peppers. You probably don't want to make that out of just pure habaneros. Maybe you do, and if you do, more power to you. But you want to maybe mix a habanero with a bunch of jalapenos mm-hmm. or banana peppers, which aren't hot at all, and start getting kind of creative that way. Yeah, I like putting just a touch of that, uh, a touch of that super hot sauce in with some. You, you can add it to like a buffalo sauce you're tossing wings in or something like that, and just a little bit, and it'll it'll heat it all up really nicely if you like hot without taking over the flavor or making it like unbearable to eat um with those really hot really hot stuff if you actually want something you can eat and not be miserable that's what i like to do or put just a drop or so of it into into a glass of antacid to help balance it don't do that guys. just just a thought, though. <laughs> i'm amazed at the the number there must be a half a million different brands you you go to mm. a county fair someplace and there's always a little booth with somebody selling their their own 63 varieties of hot sauce, and uh, so the, that that has to be one of the great cottage industries of our country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'm on a Facebook group for fermented hot sauces, and you take hmm. that, and you could either chop all the ingredients fine or run them through a blender and turn it into a mash. And then it gets covered and fermented much like sauerkraut. And this that's the tricky part. You got to keep it, if you expose it to the open air, you're going to get fur and mold and nasty stuff in it. But if it comes out where it doesn't have that and it's fermented, I believe that you take it and run it through a blender to turn it into a liquid sauce. And that's your hot sauce. You can mix all kinds of hot peppers, other peppers, fruits, things like that to come up with a million different variations of hot sauce. So I haven't had a chance to make my own one day. I will. But that company that I saw, I saw all those other hot sauces. This or the crazy ones is Blair's hot sauce. B L A I R S hot sauce.com. Um, yeah, this stuff looks crazy. <laughs> and if anybody's interested, check out, Daddle peppers, D A T I L, and you want to order them from someplace in Florida that's in the greater St. Augustine area because that's where they grow the best ones and come up with the best either peppers or sauces or salsas or whatever it is. And they're hot. Yeah, my favorite hot sauce was a product called Daddle Do It. Hmm. I've heard of that. Yep. I need to get some seeds and try growing them. And I know people with extension over there. I'll put that on my notes also. <laughs> I think my I think my favorite hot sauce is either I like there's some Tabasco or the that Texas Pete vinegar sauce, but the the really hot one I use is is called After Death. <laughs> it's like just so obscenely hot. Um, but it's that's sometimes that's what you need, I guess. Yeah, they try to find the, the, the scary graphics and the scary names. The oh, yeah, it's Reaper got like a skull on it and that. fire and stuff. <laughs> fire and brimstone hot sauce. Yeah, yeah. 
But hey, guys, it looks like it's about that time. So let me double check. Am I going to be here next week? Are we going to be here next week? Yeah, I'm going to be here uh, next yeah. week. So we'll, yeah. be, we'll be back on next week. And if you get a chance, be sure to tune in live or watch the replay. Because I'm going to try my best to find somebody who can come in as a guest and speak about hot peppers, growing hot peppers in Florida, hot sauce, things like that. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because obviously, obviously, we got a lot of engagement today and a lot of comments. So, hot sauce is a winner. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to eat. We'll have to. We'll have to. I'll have to drive over. Give you guys some of that death sauce to try. <laughs> try while we're on plant clinic. <laughs> I know. We still need to do something about grilling iguanas. That was a pretty hot topic, also. So we'll have to pull that together in the new year. Uh, yeah, Teresa spoke to that with that one. Yeah, put the hot sauce on the grilled iguana. You know, engagement the through two, the roof. The two of them would tie together. There you um, go. Grilled iguana, or um, a very, very popular recipe to make out of iguana would be iguana tacos. And that involves hot sauce. So, <laughs> okay, guys, we're coming up with some ideas here. And uh, Diana, yes, grilling iguanas. Iguanas are an invasive animal an invasive pest in florida it's a huge problem south of here down in south florida go down to miami and the darn things are all over the place down there they do a lot of damage but in central and south american countries they are eaten they are edible need to know what you're doing so um um, university of florida does have at least one fact sheet on preparing iguanas and how to do so safely um we do have a 4-H program assistant who is proficient at teaching the kids how to grill. So we got grills here at the office. We probably got charcoal. Guys, I think all, all we need is the iguana. So we're going to plan on that at some, some point in January or February. Because, you know, if work can't be fun, what's the point of getting up in the morning and going to work? I can see it now. We send out an invitation. Dear Iguana, would you like to join us for our program? <laughs> hey, January 7th. <laughs> now, uh, we go down to South Florida when it's cold. They'll just fall out of the trees. You can just pick them up. Yeah. They can, and they do if it gets cold enough. Mm -hmm. So, hey, everybody, be sure to join us again next week. We're, we'll, I'll try to get a guest in here. We'll do something special next week. And like I said, we'll start kicking around and working on the iguana idea once again for the new year um, because there seemed to be a certain amount of interest in that. And it's unique. It's a topic that Extension doesn't frequently address. So we'll do something different. So until then, thank you so much for tuning in live and thank you so much for watching Recorded. Uh, oh, let me show the banners. Super, super quick. If you need to get a hold of me, there is my email. If you need to get a hold of Colby, here is his link tree with all of his contact information. Or here is his email also. But Hernando County, you guys have long emails. I can't remember. Hernando oh, that's the, County US. That's the easy, uh, easy to remember version right there. Yeah, there's longer versions that yeah. I can't remember them. <laughs> And if you want to contact our office and speak directly with Bernie, who is here on Thursdays, there is our office phone number. Please feel free to do so or stop by the office on Thursday. See Bernie in person. Say hi. Bring him your problem leaf or plant or orange or whatever you're having a problem with. And let me double check for any last minute comments here. Until next week. We will see you later, guys. And thank you once again for everybody tuning in. See you next week. Bye, guys. Yeah, we'll have a good one.